So pleased to have the great Hale Collins, one half of the now and someone I've known for over 14 years with me today on Under the Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. Hale, so glad you're here with me today. Thank you. Hey, hey I'm happy to be here. So fittingly, let's get started with what you're doing now. Uh, you recently competed with your tag team partner, Vic Delicious, on the NWA 74 pay-per-view in St. Louis and also participated in the TV tapings afterwards. What's the NWA experience been like for you? And, uh, you know, just what is this? What has this kind of been like for you guys? Yeah, it's uh, well, it's, it's been awesome because, as as weird as it is, like um, the locker room was filled with, with so many guys that like I had I came across in the path of my my wrestling career. Like I have guys that I wrestled in camps with in two thousand and Doctor Todd Preacher camps in two thousand two, and they're in the locker room, and they're in the NWA locker room now. So it's like every like era, I feel some of the guys are in the locker room. So it's pretty cool to see everybody again. And you're one of the veterans now. Yeah. Oh well, yeah. As weird as that is. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, I've been around for a while. What's it been like, what's it like being in a tag team for so many years? There are plenty of people who are in tag teams, but I doubt any of them have been together with a few exceptions for about 16 years, give or take as you and Vic delicious have as the now, how do you, how do you keep it together and how do you evolve? Uh, well, like, it's like, I don't know. It's kind of like, um, we've been te tag team since 2005, you know? So it's like, it's been a long time. Um, the way you evolve is just to always have to over communicate. I'm really big on communication. Like if one of us has an idea, we, we evolve that, uh, that we evolve that idea, um, together and to make it one of our own, um, um, like car rides are important. Everything's important to, you know, always communicate to make sure we're heading in the right direction together. We have the same idea, same mind state, same goal, you know? And then one thing I've heard about you guys a bunch is that, you know, you look like a tag team. You've got the, the matching gear. Everything about you guys is is together. So how, how much does that kind of go into everything when you're, when you're kind of conceiving a tag team and then kind of also just, you know, trying to be creative with it? Uh, well, like, uh, it's, it's cool because like we take, we take tag team wrestling, like very, very, like very seriously. Like, uh, we love the psychology of it. Um, uh, we know that we know that we have to be a unit. It's like two versus two. It's not like, it's not like we're trying, we're not trying to shine each other. We're trying to like make, make tag team wrestling. Um, we're, we're trying to like be part of what a lot of some, a lot of great teams are trying to do is like bring up the tag team division. Um, and it's, it's cool because we've been tag teaming so long that, um, a lot of stuff comes natural, you know, um, like we, if something goes wrong in the match, we kind of know how to fix it right away. Um, and it's, it's a lot of fun. It's a lot of fun just wrestling great guys too. Like in the NWA, everybody's like good, you know, like everyone's like wants the bet wants to, um, wants to be the best, you know, and, uh, and also they want like a working relationship where they want to, they want to work together and, and, um, put on a great match, you know? So it's, it's, uh, it's really awesome. So if we rewind all the way back to the beginning, you're a fan, of course, growing up and you might be one of the biggest ECW fans I've ever met. And you were pretty young when ECW started coming to Poughkeepsie, New York and the mid Hudson Civic Center, which is, is your hometown, your local arena. What, appealed to you what kind of spoke to you about ecw and got you so into it well uh it's a, well it came out like a perfect time because when i was like when i was evolving as a wrestling fan i was ready for something new you know i was always a huge wrestling fan of like you know since like 86 87 so like i was a huge ultimate warrior fan and then i grew on from that then i respected the inside the ring wrestling like like my favorite era was 94 with Bret the Hitman Hart and Owen Hart like those that feud was so cool and the wrestling itself was like the best uh so I was, uh, as I was a fan of wrestling my mind was evolving as I got older so then at like 14 I was ready for something new ready for something but I didn't even know it yet so like I was like uh staying up late like I shouldn't have and I saw a wrestling program on MSG I believe it was MSG it's been a long time yeah. and it was like 1 a.m. or 2 a.m. Yep. I saw like ECW on and I'm like, what the heck is this? And I, I always wanted to be a wrestler, but I didn't think it was actually like possible because like I was never um, like 
on any sports teams in school. I played outside of school, but like nothing serious. Like I wasn't on varsity football. I wasn't on any of that stuff. So like seeing guys on WWE that look like pro athletes and they like, on just another level, you know. So when I watched ECW for the first time, I said this before, I saw the Sandman and I'm like, wow, that guy looks like my uncle. <laughs> like, like this might be even possible. Like this might be impossible. I don't want to go there, you know. Like, like and I got obsessed with it because it was so real. I actually at one point in my life when I was a kid, like I actually thought ECW was real as can be. Like I'm talking real. I was like, WWF is fake, WCW is fake, but ECW is real as it can be. You know, so I was very intrigued by it. Also, like you know, all the women on there, like, they're just you know, it's just as a growing teenager, I was growing with it and. It was really cool, you know, and um, so then I became obsessed with it, and I was like, I want to do this. So I looked up schools. I looked up where a lot of the ECW guys went uh, to learn how to professional wrestler wrestle, and a lot of the guys went to Johnny Rods. That's how I. That's that's what intrigued me to go to Johnny Rods, you know, and I, and again, you know, the Johnny Rods alumni speaks for itself, especially at that time when ECW was around, around like you know in the late nineties, a lot of the guys came from Johnny Rods. So the only place I could go was there. And that's why I went there. Cause uh, like I said, most of these guys were there and that's where I wanted to be. Let's rewind a little bit. So uh, can you describe a, a young Hill Collins in the audience at the mid Hudson civic center watching ECW? I know there was a real specific look that you had. <laughs> well, like I, uh, I really loved when I went to East W Live the first time. I really loved the crowd participation. And um, I never really was like a ham or like someone that needed the spotlight. But I don't know what got into me, but I really wanted to like do something to get the crowd's reaction. And so what I did was I used to sneak a blue Superman shirt in, in, in the place with blue sweatpants, and blue blue basketball shorts, and these big silver glasses with these this big blue wig. And I used to sneak it to the bathroom and put it all on and then go and then go sit in the front row and just egg the crowd on. And the crowd was <laughs> so fun. They were like, they were calling on me, like they were all chanting at me. Was, basically, I was like kind of like getting the crowd ready for the show, but not getting paid for it. <laughs> it's crazy to me that I, I only went to one original ECW show and you were probably completely doing that at the show that I attended, which was the one, the last one at the Civic Center, the one when uh, Scott Hall came out to... Oh. Uh, Ready or not by the Fuji. So you were probably totally there doing the Hell Collins yeah. shtick, and I didn't even didn't know it. Yeah, I'm on a lot of like footage, like you know, like uh, Jerry Lunaverse RVD. You see me in the main background wearing the Superman shirt. If you watch any of like the ECW shows on the network, you'll see me in the front row wearing a Superman shirt. I was there all the time. I never missed a show. Like it was, I would uh, I would wait in line at the Civic Center at like 4 a.m. I would skip school, waiting for the box office to open up at 9 a.m. And so I would get front row seats because I could have nothing other than front row. Um, I, it was a lifestyle of mine. I loved it. And I couldn't wait to be old enough to start training at, you know, at Johnny Rods, you know. So you you mentioned Johnny Rods and he was he was kind of next on my notes to to ask you about. You trained under him. For those who don't know, listeners who might not be as familiar with him, the unpredictable Johnny Rods, WWE Hall of Famer on screen. He was a bit of a journeyman, but he was a real stalwart in the company that became WWE. He was an outstanding performer who Vince McMahon Sr. would put up against newcomers to see if they could cut it or not, to see if they were going to make it. So Rods really was an essential part of WWE and its growth. And has, as you mentioned before, more credibility as a trainer than almost anybody ever. Uh, had, like, explain to me exactly how you ended up <laughs> in a room with Johnny Rods, and what was it like for you meeting him for the first time? It's, it's a really, it's a really weird story how I met him. Um, well, I, I, when I was seventeen, I sent him a letter to his school saying I want, I, I was hoping to be a part of the, you know, Johnny Rods, you know, team. And he sent me, a, he sent me a business card, or whatever. And I'm like, that's cool. And then, like, I went to a uh, Nova, Supernova autograph signing uh, at the Dragon's Den in Poughkeepsie. And this kid, uh, his name is Aaron, he was in front of me. And I overheard him talking how he was having Johnny Rods at his restaurant that night uh, in Poughkeepsie. So I was like, what the hell? This is weird. I just like a, I just sent Johnny Rods a letter, and now, now he's going to be at this restaurant. So I had it, like, I butted into the conversation, and I was like, hey, man, like, and it, like small talk happened, I became friends with him, and he invited me to uh, to the restaurant. 
to go meet him as well. So as as weird as that is, that all really happened just like that. So I became really good friends with this kid Aaron and uh we went to we went to a restaurant and I met him. He's like he's like, All right, we'll come on board. So then me and this kid, uh, who became one of my great friends, but we traveled to Johnny Rods together. Come like I have zero New York City experience. I know I only live an hour and a half away, but I have zero. I come from like a town with farms and all this other stuff. And <laughs> um and so going there two and a half out like an hour and a half down to the city, then an hour of subway rides was something I have I was only 18 years old, you know what I mean? So like I did it all on my own. I had him with me for the first couple months, but then he kind of like went a different way. It was, I think it might've been a little too tough for him or he just wanted to continue college or whatever. And, um, so I, be, I was, I ended up going alone, you know, and, uh, the first time I went to Johnny Rods in his office was a day after my 18th birthday. Uh, cause you know, you don't need parent consent after, you know, once you turn 18. So I, the, August 3rd, I went and I, I, I'm in the office. I see all these awesome pictures and all these trophies, these titles. And, and it was like, it was like a museum. So I'm like, Whoa, this is insane. And all of a sudden, like he's talking to me about it. He's talking about like a payment plan and all sorts of stuff. And then all of a sudden big Dick Dudley walks in the room and with these big snakeskin boots, he's like the biggest human I've ever seen in person. <laughs> and plus he's one of the Dudleys, you know? So I'm like, I'm not starstruck kind of not really. I'm like, wow, this is insane. I can't believe this is happening already that I'm meeting someone that I watched for years and um, he was really super nice to me. And after that, when I saw Big Dick Dudley walk in, I was like, all right, man, I'm in. I'm coming down. So I went down two days a week, uh, Mondays and Thursdays, for a good three years. And um, uh, it was very interesting when you're 18, 150 pounds, um, around grown-ass men, uh, bitter, grizzled. Uh, some of them were really great. Some of them I still talk to this day. And also around me was professional boxers. You know, like Gleason's gym has the best boxers in the world. You know, so it's like it was around a very professional atmosphere. And and um, I'm all, I was only 18 years old alone, you know, so it was, just diff- it was different. Were you familiar with Rods going in or did you kind of have to learn about him as, as you went along? Because he was a little be- he's a little before my time. Yeah, I just knew him as the as the guy that got guys ready for ECW. You know, because right. uh, don't forget, this was a long time ago. We can't just go on YouTube or right. Google or or you have to earn your information to like hand me down information. Or I gotta go get the uh, PWI magazine. Yeah, you know, that's the only info I could ever grab or get a tape from some yard sale. And maybe you'll find something that you could find something interesting from the past. But like I, there was it was very hard to do research or find matches from any other than you know what came out from WB or WCW. You know. The first time I saw him on anything, I had gotten a an I, it was tape trading. I, I had an MSG tape that had four MSG WWF episodes on it, and he was on all of them. And I remember watching him with a friend of mine. I was like, "Man, this guy's great!" And he just never wins. But like every every match he was in, I was like, "All right, this is it: Johnny Rods and Tor Kamada. This is the one he's going to win right here." And he didn't. But <laughs> yeah, Johnny Rods is a badass man. Like he like knew jujitsu and it's all this stuff. Like he knew how to fight and he knew how to protect himself. So like if he didn't like you, he would turn you into a pretzel. And and he also had the ability to make you look awesome. So like if you didn't if you didn't respect that man. It was bad news, you know, and like he got guys ready. So like basically after you walk through the curtain, Vince McMahon woke up to him. What do you think? You like either put him over, or you wouldn't put him over, you know? Or yeah. or like they would go up to him and be like, Hey, you gotta make this guy look great. You gotta make him look great. Or like you that's your job tonight. You gotta make him look like a million bucks. And you know, go out there and get the guy over and looking like a million bucks. You know, like like when people use the term jobber, it's not as Tony DeVito would Tony DeVito would always get so insulted by when someone calls someone a jobber, like kind of like calling them like a, like they're so beneath everyone. Uh, uh, DeVito always said like a jobber is a very important task that not a lot of people can do. Like a good, yeah. like a good job. Like they're supposed to enhance their, their enhancement talent. They're supposed to make the other person look good. It's very hard. Not many people could do it. You know, like not many people can sell to the point when getting the other guy over. And meanwhile, the other guys, you know, like the other guy can be totally horrible in the ring, but some guy in the ring is so good making him look like a million dollars. All the fans think that guy is the guy, but really it's the job, you know? So like some people use that term loosely, but like a, a, a professional jobber is, is, is not easy. It's very hard. And, um, it's a, it's a, it's a gift.
So what I was going to go to, you're totally right about the enhancement stuff, uh, just because, you know, if, if you look back at some of the guys who were the most responsible guys for doing that, they were all, for the most part, really excellent professional wrestlers. Yeah, you know? 100%. Giant Ross is really good. His timing's awesome. You know, even Tony DeVito, you know, his time, he can wrestle anybody and make him look like a million dollars. Yeah, because it's not easy to make somebody look good. So yeah. what, what did you learn? Take us inside Gleason's gym a little bit as best as you can. What, what, what was a given day like, you know, in that environment uh, as, a, as a kid? But you have to have a lot of heart, a lot of passion down, you know, at that time because, you know, yeah, I, the guys I was always there with that were over there was, um, you know, um, uh, Nana. He was always there. Matt Stryker was there. Boogaloo Lou, Lowrider, um, Bylong, aka Anthony. Um, there was this guy named Stu uh, Stupid Crazy, but he was really good at like the Mexican, the, uh, the Mexican style, um, like. Um, you know, Lucha Libre and stuff like that. But, like, it was grueling. I'm not going to lie. Like, I would get there at, like, 10, 30, 11, and I would start off with about 30, 50 bumps, back bumps, side bumps, front bumps, side bumps, back bumps. And it was – and, like, the ring was hard as a rock. It's not like the rings they have out now where, like, there's, little, there's more give. These rings were, like – it was, like, cement. So if you didn't land right – yeah. It was like landing on concrete and your head would snap back, hit the mat and uh, being so little, being 150 pounds, being 18, like it was, it was a lot on my body. And, and then, you know, then after that we do rolls forever, you know, rolls and, um, you know, arm drags, hip tosses. Uh, I, I would get there, say like 10, 30, 11 a.m. I wouldn't leave until six, seven. Wow. I would be there for hours and hours because some guys would come at different times. So I, sometimes I would get there, I would be by myself. So I would just bump myself just, you know, and, but then you got guys that, you know, were not that nice. You know, I had this guy that was like uh, seven foot four and he was gas the gills and he looked like a, a cyborg. And he would tell me, you have to practice me. You have to practice I have to practice gorilla presses. I'm like, okay. So then he would pick me up, gorilla press me, and drop me like 40 times. You know? <laughs> so like that seven for four with his arms extended, dropped me like you know 40 times. I would get up, pick up, bam, get up, boom, get up, bam, and um, and like I would go home freaking sore as hell, you know. But I'll go back, go back, and then I remember one time Nana, Nana was the best because he was a good, you know, he was good. Um, uh, he would say good things to me. So I would have a really bad day at training because, you know, some guys would take liberties. Some guy would just bump me to death. I don't know why they would do it. You know, it was a different time then. I guess some guys were bitter. I really don't know or or thought uh, uh, some way about me. But um, uh, Nana would say, you had a bad day today. You got to come back uh, Monday. You got to come back. Make sure you come back because you're going to have a good day. And I would have a great day. So, like, every time I had a bad day, Nana, Nana would be in my head being and say, come back, just keep coming back. So I never stopped. I never stopped and I always kept coming back. And I'm happy you said that because some days I didn't feel like coming back, you know? Yeah. And I know you've kept in touch with Johnny a little bit too. I know you went down there with David Arquette actually when he was training uh, up here a few years ago. What, what was that day like uh, bringing somebody who is a Hollywood actor into uh, a guy <laughs> that's kind of a, a, a grizzled wrestling trainer? Yeah, that was that was a fun time because you know David Kett was looking for a place to train, you know, for his documentary, and, and he's getting ready to get in the ring again. So I was like, "Yo, I'll help you out," because like he was in the area filming a movie. So um, I brought him down to Johnny Rods, and no disrespect to David Kett, but this is uh, he was walking into a place where like Johnny Rods doesn't care who you are, he doesn't care where you've been, what you're doing. If you're gonna go there to train, you're gonna train right. So I brought David in the office, and uh, it was really easy. I was so surprised how easy it was because like. I go to John. Hey, John, I got my friend, you know, David here. We're just going to use the ring for a little while. I know you don't like outsiders using the ring, but uh, he's just, he's not from, from here. So we're just looking for a training day. He goes, oh, hell, it's one of your guys. No questions asked. Get in the ring. Have a good time training. I'm like, oh, that was really easy. All right. <laughs> so the next time I uh, go there, because we're going to go train again, totally different. Totally different. Because I, I sit down. Hey, John, you like sit out. I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, he goes, so I go, he goes, so I go home and, uh, my wife goes, my, I go to my wife, like, Hey, this guy, uh, David, uh, Arquette trained with, uh, Hale today. And she's like, what? David Arquette, like the David Arquette from Scream and all this other stuff. And I'm like, and I'm like, yeah, he's like, yeah. And he's like, why? 
well, she's like, that's like a big deal. Like, what are you doing? Like, what do you do? So Johnny's like, you put one over on me. You know, I don't know. I work, I come here every day. I, I do my jewelry. I focus on my students. I don't really look at anything else other than what, what of that, you know? So he doesn't really watch movies and stuff like that. So like, then he, when his wife told him that he got very, very educated on who he was, you know? Uh, through the boys and you know, all their stuff, and um, so then Johnny was all right. Well, you want to train to be? You want to train? Let's go. So he got David in the ring, and uh, Johnny Ross got in the ring at seven years old, bumping <laughs> David Arquette and having him roll and all this other stuff. And I go to David. I'm like, I'm like, listen, this is kind of like you just walked into the mafia, you know? Like you got to just just listen to him. Two ears, one mouth. You know, just listen to him. Get the training done. This is for real. Do not disrespect this man um because this is real deal right now kid <laughs> but david david's good with that kind of stuff too oh he was great you know, his, just... role, his roles were perfect his bumping was great johnny Riles wrestled around a little bit and like it was like like david is a very athletic person like but even like, even yeah but i was gonna say even aside from the wrestling the technical actual wrestling of it his respect for you know the business itself and the people that came before him is is why you still see David Arquette, you know, welcome in dressing rooms to this day. Dude, he he was so respectful and like he learns quick. Like David's like I feel like if like you know you go back and then he could like he could he could really do it, man. He's like really he's like naturally gifted. So it's like it was like Johnny Ross loved him. He said he'd come back anytime. Doesn't matter. Blah blah. blah. And like and like Johnny Ross, like I said, does not care who you are. You know, like he does not care. He he's been through it all, and he was and and Dave was just such a nice guy, and like he's probably one of the nicest humans I've ever met. You know, yeah. so it's like he was very respectful, and and he didn't have to. You know, he doesn't have to be if you really think about it. You know, and like and he respected the art, he respected the place, Gleason Shim itself, and um, and John Ross loves him. You know, and uh, he's welcome back anytime. That's so great. Uh, yeah. So after you were training Johnny Rods, you moved on to Tony DeVito because uh, he had a, a ring a little bit closer to home from, from where you were. Can you explain kind of the role that DeVito had in your growth and development? How, uh, how, how close to actually stepping into the ring as a wrestler were you when you got to DeVito? Well, I, I, I was kind of like, you know, I was training a lot. I wasn't really getting anywhere because all I did was just train and uh, go to like the school shows. And Johnny Rods is really against you going out on your own other than school. But uh, me and John got re along really well, and he gave me, like, you know, um, he, like, gave me the okay to go start doing shows, you know, which was big because he doesn't really do that. So, like, I started going to Dr. Tom Pritchard camps in 2002 in Boston, and that's where I met guys like Aaron Stevens. That's where, I, like, I saw um, Vic Delicious again. Uh, that's where I saw, like, you know, like, just guys that I haven't seen ever outside a wrestling school. So these guys were from chaotic. It was really cool. So like I started doing camps, so it still wasn't working, you know? So like I wasn't getting booked anywhere. I didn't know how to get booked. I was so young minded, you know, I'm only like 20. Um, and then, so this guy, uh, one of my good friends, uh, Lou Santiago, who was also known as Diablo Santiago, part of the outcast killers, uh, back in the day, great tag team, by the way, if you ever want to look up some cool stuff, look up the outcast killers. They're uh, pretty big in the mid two thousands, but, um, they, he goes, Hey man, like I, I, I met him, met him at the camp and somehow I met him at Marist college. I bumped into him small world. I don't understand how that happened, but long story short, I bumped into Diablo Santiago out of college and he goes, Hey man, like if you want to come train, Tony DeVito has a, a ring in Newburgh. So I'm like, wow, that's only like 25 minutes. Holy crap. That's awesome. So like I could do a less commute than going out of Brooklyn to go train. So that's why I met Tony DeVito for the first time. And Tony DeVito has been awesome because he took me under his wing. Um, he like basically coached me and he started bringing me to DPW Connecticut. He started uh, bringing me to ring of honor shows. Be, let me be part of the ring, ring of honor um, ring crew uh, from like the awesome days from like 2005 to like 2000, uh, 2003 to 2006. I was part of the ring crew for ring of honor and um, I met a lot of guys through there. So like Tony Vito opened the door for me to network and uh, get out there and, hit the pavement, as you could say. Without Tony DeVito, I'm, I'm not sure where I would be right now because he's the best.
And you mentioned about uh, Diablo Santiago too, and it's important to note that he is actually a college administrator now. <laughs> yeah. yeah, I know. So, I, I, like, it makes sense that I met him there. You know, so, yeah. but, but yeah, that was he, where I met him too. But he was already he was working there when I met yeah, him. Yeah. But I, I, I think he's somewhere else now. But yeah, he's he's that's his career now. Yeah, so, he's, uh, he's he's very successful, and uh, he was also a great wrestler. Yeah, great guy too. Yeah. Um, you've been an independent wrestler your entire career. What is the key to your hustle to kind of, you know, get all the opportunities that you get? It's funny to me when people say that, you know, someone's successful or not, because really it all just depends on how you define success. Like, and, well, and I, I think you've had a lot of it. Well, it's like, it's like, what, uh, it's like stepping stones, you know, it's like, it's like, uh, first I just wanted to get into a wrestling ring and then I'm like, well, now I want to have a match. Now I want to wrestle on different shows. And, um, you know, then, you know, it really just, like, of course, everybody wants to get a career. Everybody wants to sign a contract and make it that your job. And, and I did strive for that. I strived for it for a very long time. Um, I went to all the W camps, FCW camps, OVW camps, uh, Dr. Tom camps, Tommy Dreamer camps. Like, you know, I really strived. It was really tough, the dark ages from, like, 2000 to 2012, I would say. There was that many places to go. And the place they could go, guys were really good and had really good spots. You know, it was really hard to break in. And um, there was no really any... YouTube wasn't really successful. There was no social media. Couldn't get yourself over. It was all about word of mouth and um, sending tapes in. You know, sending tapes and send your tape in and like, and like, who knows if your tape even got watched? Or sometimes they would say if you do one little thing wrong, they would shut the tape off and throw it away. You know, and um, it was just really tough. You know, so like, it's it's a big boom right now. I feel there's a lot of places you can wrestle and. Um, you know, I got to wrestle in the Civic Center, you know, Northeast Wrestling. Thanks to, you know, Michael Lombardi for giving me the opportunity to wrestle in that building and also do some amazing stuff in that building. Uh, you know, a place I grew up watching wrestling. And, um, you know, I got to do a lot of cool stuff. Um, you know, and then this whole NWA thing happened, which is amazing because now, you know, I'm surrounded by professionals. There's totally a professional atmosphere. You get treated like a professional. Um, there's no games. There's no, not much politics going on. The boys are awesome. The girls are awesome. Um, um, it's like a fun ride right now. Definitely. I feel like I feel a little validated that, you know, that all my hard work is like uh, paid off a little bit. You know, I was thinking of this before and I don't think I've ever actually asked you this, but uh, why the name Hill Collins? Who is Hill Collins? Where, how did the persona and kind of everything evolve <laughs> over time? Was this something that just kind of came to you or was there actually a reason for it? Well, it's funny because uh, I always, I'm not, I don't, you know, like, of course I wasn't a big drinker then, you know, and I don't know why, but the top, the name Tom Collins always sounded cool, you know, the drink. And I, so I go to DeVito and like, and I'm like, DeVito, like, what do you think about not Tom Collins, Chris Collins? And he's like, Chris Collins. I went to high school with Chris Collins. And I'm like, <laughs> oh, well, I don't know. I thought it was kind of cool. It's Chris Collins, you know? And he's like, no, it doesn't work. Uh, how about like, Dale? How about like, uh, how about hell? You know, and I'm like, hell. All right. Well, there's no hails in wrestling. Uh, at the time, you know, there's no hail. There's, you know, and I'm like, all right, well, I like it. You know, so he goes, yeah, hail. So now I'm like, your hail comes. I'm like, all right, cool. Take it. And you, I mean, you've you've had that name for almost the entirety of your career. Yeah, since 2002. Yeah, wow. Yeah. Um, I'm not sure if that's a good thing, but I mean, Stuck with me the whole time. There's been other hails. There's been other people saying they're the now, you know? <laughs> yeah, no. <laughs> it but, means but, something. Yeah, what's cool about that is, like, uh, with the now is, like, you know, when I came up with it, uh, I went to a Dr. Tom uh, – no, I went to a Tommy Dreamer camp, okay? And Tommy Dreamer, uh, we had you promos. So this is, like, 2005. So, like, I had this promo. It was all set. I was going to do it on Tommy Dreamer, you know? I, like, had this great promo. I couldn't wait for it. And then right when I get into the ring, Tommy Dreamer goes, by the way, everybody, why everyone to listen up? No promos are allowed on me. <laughs> so I'm like, I'm not really a good talker as it is. So I'm like, holy crap, now I got to think of something real quick because Tommy just said I can't do any promos on him. My promos in my head all about him. So I, I try to improvise and like I, I try, I did a horrible promo on my, like my knee, like I, I lost my knee pad. Someone stole my, my, my um, gym bag and it's bad luck and all this other stuff. It was horrible. It was completely trash. It was horrible. Worst promo ever in the history of wrestling. And uh, Tommy goes, you know, the only thing I know about you is you make pizza for my best friend back at home. And that's all I know. So you got to come up with something. 
come up with a gimmick, come up with something. Uh, be the next Mr. Perfect, be the next Rick Rude, be something. And I'm like, so I got home and I'm like thinking to myself, that sucks. I don't want to be next any. I don't want to be the next same person. I want my own persona. So then I like watching Wayne's World and like Wayne's World came on and like Garth is telling Wayne to live in the now, you know, live in the now, Wayne, live in the now. And I'm like, yeah, that's what you do. That's what you gotta do. I don't want to be like anyone else. I want to be me. I want to live in the now. I don't want to think about the past, the future, nothing. I want to think right now. So I thought of it, and then I went to Ron Buffone, who was, um, you know, he worked for ECW with, yep. uh, alongside with Tommy Dreamer. And Ron loved it. He was like, dude, you got to trademark this. So Ron gave me his lawyer, um, and I went down to Rockland or whatever, and I met with a lawyer, and I got it trademarked. That's great. And I, you know, you, you mentioned before about promos and stuff. Yeah. And I know cutting promos for you was not something that was always natural, but I think you're actually good at it now. And it, it, cool. do you just feel like more confident about yourself now and just doing, like your full presentation? Yeah. Well, like I like when someone tells you what they, what, what they, what direction they want to go or, or what needs to be about. Cause I think of so many ideas all at once, you know, my brain, it's all like frazzled. I'm like, it's like starts haywiring, you know? So I have like so many ideas and it all hit me at once. I don't know what to do. I don't know which one to do. So if someone tells me directly, like, Hey, I need this, I need that. Uh, throw some of your stuff in there, but that's basically the idea that I need. It's so much easier for me. And don't forget, like Vic is a great talker. So we were and it, being a tag team for him so long, I would just let him talk because he's so good at it, you know. So like it, we like we try to complement each other's strengths, you know. But the only flaw with that is during the whole time I wasn't really doing it, so it wasn't really getting better at. It. So you know, when he hurt his when he hurt his leg, um, I was forced to talk more, and. Um, I found some stuff out in the way in, the, in, the, in that path of, uh, you know, being able to talk better, I guess. Certainly. All right, we're going to move on to something we call the three count now. It's going to be three quick questions and your answers. So first one, what was your favorite old school ECW theme music and why? Oh, man, that's good. That's so many. Uh, I would ha I, not, not to sound so generic, but it would have to be uh, Rob Van Dam's Walk. Uh, the Pantera. Crowd, yeah, Pantera. Uh, the crowd participation when that happened, man, the place erupted. Uh, or Just Incredibles. What was his theme song? I don't remember the name of it. I can't think. It's like I uh, can, I can, like snap. dope, dope or something like that. It was, yeah, snap your fingers, snap your neck. It was just right. It was really, really good. You know. So those two. I mean, they're all good. Man. When you hear good. when you hear ECW songs in real life, does it immediately bring you back to to that time? Yes. Yeah, so sometimes I'm like, man, I should listen to this before a match. <laughs> I, I I was doing karaoke once with somebody who was a wrestling fan, and I did uh, "Say It Ain't So" by Weezer, and he said, "Did you do that because of the Sandman, Mikey Whipwreck woman uh, music video that they had on the ECW TV show?" I said, "That's exactly <laughs> the reason why I was doing that song because that was what they played when she was caning." Uh, Mikey Whipwreck. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, Mike Whipwreck, good, good one too. I think it was the um, loser by Beck. Will they say his name in the in the song? Oh, did they? Did the crowd do that? I don't know. No, like a, he. I think he, the original one came out. I thought I want to say it was the balls. Uh, oh wow! I have to check that out. I don't know. Yeah, I remember when he. Was I, I, I liked it because they said his name in the song when he first started. And he said, wow. So uh, you've always had a uh, second question. You've always kind of had an eighties uh, kind of look and persona in your, at least in your single stuff. Uh, what, what are some, uh, give me your best eighties song that isn't used in as, as pro wrestling theme song. That could be like a good eighties song. That could be like a, a wrestling theme. Yeah. That isn't. Although, oh, man, I don't know. Cause I like the one you come out to, which is what uh new order. Uh, yeah. Uh, New Order. Um, God, I can't think of I can't, I'm horrible at names, you know. But um, yeah, New Order is really good. Um, I don't know. So many. No, it's a whole 10 years worth. So, you know. Yeah, but yeah, it's all 10 years. But also, you think about wrestling music. Wrestling music. Oh, my God. I, I, I got to sit here and like, I really think, you know, like you go like crowd participation, you go like, you know, like you go something cheese like Bon Jovi, you know, or you can go out like something deep where like really hits like the true eighties minded people, you know, like the whole retro. True, true, yeah. True, true faith. I think was the name of the song you came out to. Yeah. True faith. Yeah. It's good. Yeah. Yeah. I, the one I think works right now, I think it's actually a little bit older than eighties. Orange Cassidy coming out to uh Jane by uh, Jefferson starship. Yo, it's so good. Yeah. Yeah. His, his other song was really good too. Um, 
The Pixies, yep. yeah. Yeah, they both worked, but the new one's really good. I thought it was funny the other night on, uh, we're recording this on se- September 12th, but uh, the other night on Dynamite when uh, the song hit and Taz basically just told the other announcers to be quiet because he wanted to listen to <laughs> the Jefferson. He's like, hold on, hold on. We, we, we can hold this point until after he's, after he's out. But, yeah, it's, uh, one thing, it's one thing it's like, it's cool about AW is like that is the theme music. They, really, they do a good job on that. Yeah. And like, and like one thing I loved about ECW is like, which kind of stinks that you can't really watch it on the network. So people that never, really experienced ecw from back in the day like they don't really get the whole the whole um experience because the ecw music was really a huge part in the yeah. in, in the in the program like it really was man they're like if anyone out there wants to get someone gets all some old ecw tapes that has like the real music on there grab them because it's fun to watch yeah, and of course they weren't producing them for audiences in 2022. They were producing them for audiences in 95 and 96 and 97, so they didn't have to worry about paying for the, uh, yeah, the, the music if they, if they weren't uh, going to use it. So then yeah. the last three ki- ki- question I had was, uh, what was uh, your favorite uh, Mid-Hudson Civic Center moment that you were not performing in? Uh, it would have to be the Sid Tower Bombs. Which show was that at? Uh, well, like, like as a fan you're saying? Yeah. Uh, I'm still have a fan, but like, as a fan, I would say, if everyone like after WrestleMania 11, Sid, oh, uh, that uh, Shawn Michaels was saying the night like, off. I'm giving you the night off, and he was like, "He don't give me the night off. He don't give me nothing but respect. You stupid little puke!" And like, he just kicks him and stuff. He just power bombs him like four times, like vicious power bombs. Like it was pretty awesome. Such a crazy different time in wrestling when you could look back and for those who maybe weren't following back then, the Raw after WrestleMania in 1995 was at the Mid-Hudson Civic Center in Poughkeepsie, New York, which is kind of crazy to think about. That You look at what the Raw after WrestleMania is now, and no, it's, it's like, literally across the street from where I'm sitting right now. <laughs> yeah, it's like huge. Like it was like people wait for it. You know, people can't wait for the restart, you know? Yeah. And like, and like, but... That I really liked that moment with Sid and Shawn Michaels. I thought it was great. So I was a huge Sid Sid fan. You know, well, Hell Collins. Thank you so much for joining us today on another Ring Pro Wrestling Conversations. Really, I've always supported your career, but uh, great stuff you're doing right now with NWA and other places. And good to see the tag team back together. And uh, just good to see you. Yeah, you too, Phil. Thank you. You've always been great, man. So the, you've been long. You've, we've been we've been together for this ride for a long time. Yep, absolutely.